there's two things that come to mind when it comes to feedback like that. One is you've got to build a foundation of a lot of positivity. So, you know, the more that you're positive, the more positives that you have, when you have that constructive piece or that constructive challenge, it makes it that, that much easier to receive it. Welcome to the More Than Corporate Podcast. I'm Amber Furman, recovering perfectionist and serial accomplisher. If you're anything like I used to be, You've been living your life thinking that if you accomplish enough stuff, you'll finally find the success you've always wanted. But what if it's not about accomplishing more stuff? What if it's about accomplishing the right stuff? I believe you don't find success. You create it by intentionally designing the life you want and having the courage to get out of your comfort zone to live your design. I went from doing what I was supposed to do to doing what I love to do, and now I get to help others do the same. Keep listening as I chat with inspiring people who make it their mission to live their best life every day and learn how you too can live the life you've always wanted. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the More Than Corporate Podcast. I'm super excited for the guest that I have today and I know I, when I say this, I feel like I say it every single week. There's this thing when you get to talk to other attorneys, though, that just makes me all excited, especially attorneys that are finding ways to reach audiences in a new way and are having conversations about what life could actually be like instead of just this head down going through law school and this day-to-day -day attorney life. So I'm really excited for you to hear from Jessica. She is a spouse, mother, leader, lawyer, talent management professional, technology enthusiast, Gallup certified strengths coach, which is totally amazing, and now a writer. After graduating from St. Louis University School of Law, Jessica went to work for Espiritech, an immersion impact partner. She initially focused on contracts and legal matters before expanding to her primary passion of talent management. And later she broadened even further to lead information technology, customer service, project coordination, and order management. For 10 years, Jessica has worked to shape Experitech's talent management program into an exceptional workplace by creating strategies for peak performance. Experitech has been recognized three times by Gallup with an exceptional workplace award and four times by the St. Louis post-dispatch as a top workplace. Jessica's purpose in life is to help people live exceptional lives, which you know I'm all about. And she believes that workplaces can and must help contribute to those lives. This purpose led her to write the book and share key insights, learning, and practices to help individuals in any role any location and any size organization evolve to reach peak performance. I'm so excited to bring her on and have this conversation. Really quickly before I do, remember that this episode is brought to you by Success Development Solutions and the Design Your Life Book Club. I believe that you rise to the level of the personal development that you take in and you do that even better when you are surrounded by individuals who are reading the same thing that you are and you're learning their perspectives and you're seeing what's possible in the world. And then when we actually get to connect you to authors as well. So I'm really excited for that. If you are somebody who wants a accountability reading, who wants to read different things, wants to be able to talk about that, and then wants to meet the author, comment underneath and let's have a conversation about how to get you started on this. Again, it's Success Development Solutions and the Design Your Life Book Club. With that being said, let's go ahead and bring in Jessica. Hi. Hey, Jessica. Thank you so much. I'm so excited for this. Thanks for taking the time. Absolutely. Me too. I love this is my favorite topic also. So I love it. And I love the the book club. Um, one of I'm um I'm an avid reader myself. My husband likes to joke that there's three books within reach of me at any given time. So um, I love I love books. Yes, me too. And you know, it's interesting because I feel like I used to look at people and be like, how do you read more than one book at a time? And I think that that came from law school where I was just so dedicated on one specific thing. And then I quit reading in law school because I was like, if I have to look at words on pages, I'm going to scream. <laughs> and then like I recovered and started reading again. And now I'm the same way. I'll read multiple books at a mm -hmm. time. 
Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, I've never thought about it from that it came from law school, but you're right. Like so much reading in law school. This this at least is stuff I get to pick. So Yes, exactly. So let's talk for just a minute about this whole law school connection. One of the things I always get asked and I love to hear other answers is, did you always know you wanted to go to law school? What did like 12, 13 year old Jessica want to do? So yeah, I kind of always did. Um, I was super argumentative as a kid. Um, I debated my way out of lots of punishments. Um, and I just really loved, you know, that that um, interaction. So I always thought I was, that was always my plan was to go to law school. My plan was not to do something totally different after I went to law school. But, you know, that's that's how things work out sometimes. Yeah. So when you went to law school, what did you think your career was going to be? I really thought I was going to go into litigation. Um, I thought I was going to going to take that path, be in the courtroom. Um, I loved, you know, I loved that. I did a lot of um, volunteer work um, in the in the courtroom for our um, Catholic Legal Assistance Ministries while I was in in law school, and I really enjoyed that. Um, but I I graduated in 2010 at the economic um, you know downturn, and it was just a really really tough time to make that to make that transition. Yeah. Did do you think that the economic downturn pushed you into other directions you wouldn't have gone otherwise? Or was that thought process already spinning based upon your volunteer experience? Yeah, no, it, I I had I had thought I was going to go into the a firm. I actually at the time um, the law firms were waiting until bar results came back in order to to make offers because they wanted to make sure that you actually passed the bar before making an offer. Um, and so in the interim, I went to work for Experitech. They were doing an acquisition and um, and a merger, and so I went in just to defray legal costs, um, you know, to get experience and 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 be there. Um, and so that acquisition took me through the the fall. I was actually recruiting or being recruited for a number of legal positions when I ultimately decided that I was really loving the people that I was working with. And so um, I decided to stay. I love that. So what was that process like for you as you were deciding to stay? Because I know that I have a somewhat similar, I thought I was going to be doing public defender work. I ended up in immigration, which are not the same. And um, I, I struggled to wrap my head around the fact that this life I had created for myself in law school wasn't going to happen. Did you have any of that identity attachment or did it come pretty easy to transition to something you loved? I think, I think it was, a, I think there was some struggle there certainly to make this shift but I was pretty excited about, I started, um, the way it happened was as part of my work, the the business was growing. And so they asked me to put together a, a plan and a, a position, a talent development coordinator position um, for them to hire. And then through that process, you know, it, there was discussions of, well, should I just do it for a while? Should I? And initially, my commitment was for two years. I would, I would come, I would build it for a couple of years, then I would get back on the legal track. And, um, and I just fell in love with it. I love helping people be the best that they can be. And I love, you know, development and talent management and strategy and, and all those things. So, um, so really, I think kind of think of it as I, I, I advocate, um, but just in a different setting. Yeah. When you say talent management, let's talk about what you're referring to. What does that actually mean? So um, there's kind of a funny story behind that. So the, the the company I work for, the former president, he's now retired, had an aversion to the to the term HR. Okay. Um, he, he did not like HR. So we had this running joke the whole time whenever somebody said, like, is HR going to be upset about this? I'd say, what? We have an HR department? Like, <laughs> I'm in trouble. Um, but so we, we called it talent management because unlike the traditional, you know, old school HR process payroll, um, be the complaint department, you know, type of model, what we wanted was more of a, a manager culture driven model where talent management really was the strategy and the support behind them. So it wasn't people coming to us to figure out their plan or their path. They were working with their managers. Their managers were the ones that were coaching and developing them. And we provided a, a supporting strategy and role that, that allowed them to be successful as managers and leaders. This is like, I just want to hug you right now with how amazing this sounds. Like, you know, most people think of the job force as you see a job, 
you apply for a job and then you find a way to fit yourself into the box of that job, which doesn't benefit anybody. And you guys have flipped the script on that and said, let me learn about you. Let me learn what you're passionate about, what you're good at. Let's see what we can do to develop you and put you in the right position. Um, instead of trying to fit, you know, people in a box they don't belong in. When do you work with other companies in doing this now, or are you solely doing that with this, with this company? Like what, what is your consulting? Yeah. Because like? this is needed like for everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. So like Experitex, I was on the journey for 10 years. Um, I've learned a lot. We've been um, named a, a Gallup Exceptional Workplace three years in a row, a St. Louis uh, post dispatch Top Workplace four years in a row. So we've really, not that you ever master this, it's like an always evergreen, you got to work at it, you got to keep keep making progress, but we've kind of got the formula, right? So my, one, of, one of my motivators for writing the book that I wrote is really to um, to provide that resource to more organizations, to, to provide that venue um, in other places to be applied, and actually not even just workplaces. Um, although that's that's where I play, that's where I I'm I'm pretty experienced. But I think it can apply to our roles at home and our roles in the community as well. And I think all the knowledge exists out there. We just need to uh, apply it effectively. Yeah. So as a business owner, um, how does one start to, because what I'm thinking, and I'm not articulating it well, is that this sounds great. And then people start thinking, but I have all of these jobs that need to get done and I don't have time to do this. And my, my business has to function. And I think that right now we're in a culture where being able to provide an amazing experience for your employees is so important. And yet big corporations think that that means heavy 401k packages and, and spa days and, and things that really don't actually make somebody feel as appreciated as putting them in a job that is curated for them based upon. So how do we get through to big corporations? Yeah, that this so is good for them. So I like to think of it as we've got to evolve business and and people don't want corporate anymore. Like they don't want to be, um, you know, a, a cog in a wheel. They want to to matter. They want, you know, to have purpose and, and passion in what they're doing. And so, uh, you know, I think the secret in my mind is it's really not that hard to do. Um, it is just a commitment to doing it. Um, so once you once you commit to it and actually the way that we approach it is that it's not separate from the work when you separate talent management or HR practices or anything outside of the work that's getting done. It all falls apart because nobody ever gets to it. It has to be really integrated into how you're executing the work and the things that you're doing every day. And, you know, I, I joke you talked about job descriptions. I joke a lot that I hate or like into the box of a job. I hate job descriptions because either they're so detailed that you're like locked in and they change tomorrow or they're so vague that you have no idea what you're supposed to do. And mm -hmm. so I think that there's a happy medium and there's a, a, a good opportunity to leverage things that, that you do well and apply them and use them effectively. Doesn't mean you're going to enjoy every element of your job. There's parts of everybody's job that we don't enjoy. But if you can enjoy most of it, you're going to be so much more satisfied when you go when you go home. Yeah, and I think that enjoyment is contextual based upon how much purpose you feel for your job, right? Like I think that if you feel like you're just doing a job that anybody could do, that it becomes tedious. But when you feel that you are an integral part of making a company successful, then you're more willing to deal with the stresses that come along with your day-to-day -day job. Uh, absolutely. And if you, you know, I like to think of it as you treat people as people. And so you really treat them the whole person because that's who's coming to work and they're coming to work with all the things that they have going on outside of work they don't put them down they don't change who they are they try but it's not mm -hmm. effective it's not helpful um and so i really believe fundamentally i believe that you can have profit people and purpose they can all coexist and actually when you do it well the results are even greater. You see much better results. And, and that's not just me saying it. 
Gallup's got decades of research that shows that that's true, that the more engaged, the more committed your organization is, the better your employee experience, the better your profits are. So it's almost so obvious it's it's surprising more businesses aren't aren't doing it yeah it's it's interesting and you know i wonder how much of it is a disconnect between you know especially in a corporate environment between a management level to where they don't even realize there's a problem because there's it's such a big company so smaller businesses you know i feel like this is something where it's not necessarily a lack of knowledge as much as it is a lack of understanding of how to implement and the best ways to do it. Um, so let's break those down for just a minute. First of all, your book, um, which I'm super excited to come out, is called The Exceptional Life Revolution. Is that how you pronounce that? There's a hyphen there. Yeah, so it's the revolution, but it's both a revolution and an evolution. So Ooh. it's it's that we have to evolve our businesses, our our communities, and our families to the next level of our performance, and and that we're going to start a revolution that does that, that brings people to living exceptional lives because we can do that if we apply the right practices. Awesome. And is the book for employees, employers, or both? all of the above. So it, and, and including any role. So the principles that I write about, so this all started in the workplace, but I've learned that the same things apply to my role as mom. Um, and I, I have to do, if I do the same things in my role as mom, I'm a better mom. I'm a better parent to my kids. Um, and so I've really applied it in a lot of different contexts so that, you know, really anybody in any role can get a, a benefit out of this book. You know, it's so interesting that you say that. I just recently hired an executive assistant company to train an executive assistant for me. And I was telling the person that I was hiring, like, I want, I need this for Amber, the podcaster, Amber, the speaker, Amber, the coach. I'm not sure that I need this for Amber, the attorney, because I have my paralegal. And he's like, that's not the way life works. Like you either need an executive assistant, you know, and, and you look at Amber as you, right? And so mm -hmm. I love that you're bringing that in that, and I know this because I would tell my clients the same thing, but we look at ourselves and we segment us. And so I love that you're pointing that out to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the employee reads this book and gets the advantage out of okay, I can make these changes from a day to day. The employer reads this and says, oh, I can make these changes day to day. And also I can make these changes with my staff. What about that corporate employee that hasn't left yet to start their own thing, but they're starting to feel that grind of being in the corporate environment. Their bosses aren't going to change anytime soon. What can they do day to day to make those changes themselves without necessarily having to change corporate structure? Yeah, so um, I actually talk about that. So I think you can you can start at an individual level, you know, managers or leaders, any anywhere along the line, obviously gets better the further that you're able to progress or change the overall culture. But I think even in an individual role, so a, an example is I talk about that it, as an individual employee, you might create your own draft, what you think is expected for you to achieve in your role. What are the outcomes? What are the responsibilities? What are the goals, the things you're working to? And then bring it to your manager and say, I want to see how aligned we are. Like, this is what I've, this is what I've put together to, to make sure that I understand what I'm supposed to accomplish and that I'm going to be able to meet those, you know, meet those, those results. And so then you get to, then you start the conversation. You don't have to wait for a manager to come, you know, to come talk to you or, or to come um, progress you. There is always, I think, a point. There's a lot you can do within a role, but then there's always a point that if the culture is toxic and you're not and you're not getting where you need to be, that if you have another opportunity, then a move makes sense. But I think there is a lot you can do to improve the situation that you're in, even within an environment that isn't as progressive. Yeah, I'm loving this idea and this whole conversation because one of the problems that I have with the coaching industry right now is it seems like everybody's saying if you're unhappy in your job, then either find a new job or go out and start your own thing. Like you're unhappy because you're answering to someone, right? And now we get to have this conversation that the flaws that we all bring into a job, because we don't know any better about how to best utilize our practices because and our talents, because we haven't had that conversation with ourselves, that mindset and those those 
flaws, for lack of a better word, go to your new job with you. Whereas mm -hmm. if you started with this and you started to say, okay, what changes can I make? You could potentially be, if you're working for a non-toxic company, you could be the change that starts to get that ball rolling. And if you're working for a toxic company, you're doing the work for yourself that when that other opportunity comes up, you can now present that to somebody who's willing to listen, which I think is something that we're not talking about right now. Yeah, I would say, so I talk a lot about accountability and mindset. Um, and I think it's probably the most fundamental and important thing people ever learn in their lives. And the most the most critical thing I've ever heard is that our happiness is, is not the result of our circumstances. It's the result of how we're thinking about our circumstances. And so, you know, I think that if you can find a way to be happy, even in that environment, if you can apply and there are steps like especially in the accountability and mindset space, there are really good um, and I include them in my book, really good techniques to think about how what's your role in the problem or the frustration you're having? What's one thing you can do to bring about change? You know, what steps have you taken to look at it from a different perspective? Who might you ask questions to? Um, and actually throughout the book, and I am going to, along with the book, um, is going to be a free workbook you can download from my website. Um, there will be a code in the book or a, a link in the book to, to get that. And you can download that workbook. And there are um, different, uh, there's different insights or, or reflection um, spots throughout the book to help you kind of translate it. Because like you said, I'm a big believer in that in order for people to really learn, like I can write all the knowledge, it already exists out there. But if they're really going to translate it into action, then you have to then you have to define what it looks like for yourself and what you're going to do with it. Like, how is that going to apply in your context? So nothing I really write in my book is like earth shattering. I'm not a, you know, researcher. I'm not a Harvard professor. I'm an everyday person who worked to create a culture without big expensive consultants without, you know, big programs. Um, we just built it piece by piece. And I think that um, by, you know, by um, taking the time, even as an individual to go through that reflection and define those actions, you can make a lot of progress. Yeah. What? So this is always the uncomfortable conversation for us as business owners to have, because you mentioned accountability and it's so important for employees to be accountable to their management and their bosses. However, it's also important for business owners to be accountable for their employees. And I know that sometimes some of the most difficult and uncomfortable conversations to have is sitting down your employees and saying, Hey, what can I do better to work for you? Mm -hmm. Do you talk about that in your book or, or is that something that's down the lines of what you're dealing with? Yeah, no, I do. Um, and so, so when I talk about accountability, I talk, I am always coming at it from a personal accountability standpoint, not a, I'm going to hold you accountable, but I'm going to hold myself accountable and always um, operating from that space. Um, and a belief that if, if people are operating from that space, that they, they will be better, they will produce better results for themselves and the business. Um, but one of my most transformative experiences I talk about in the book for myself was when my employees gave me some feedback on a survey that oh, it was probably five, six years ago, my direct reports that my the score around, you know, I trust my manager wasn't as high as I would have liked. It wasn't like a zero, but I was like, I, I'm doing all this talent management stuff. Like, how can you not be giving me a higher score? Like, what, what am I doing? And I frankly, it devastated me. I, I was super upset about it. But after I, you know, calmed down and processed it, I went to the team and I said, okay, I see this. Why is this the case? Help me with what I need to do differently. And thankfully, they were really honest with me. And they told me the truth about what the things were that I was doing that they were struggling with. And it has transformed our relationships because I really did want to be different. And, you know, I started listening more, letting them give their opinion first um, so I could hear their perspective before providing my own. 
And the results of that were huge. I learned a lot of things I wouldn't have learned before. I, it changed decisions that I was going to make and helped me to make better decisions because they were able to be honest and share perspectives with me. Um, and, and now the people that I work with are some of the closest relationships that I have in the world because we, we just trust each other and we have that level of authenticity. But um, it takes work to get there. It's not, it's not easy. But managers that do that, they are the ones that become great managers. Like I, I didn't get there by accident. I got there because I had a great team of people who were willing to tell me the truth um, and help me get better as a manager and a leader. Yeah, it's it's interesting that we're having this conversation because I recently put together a survey for my staff and this was a piece of advice. I think it was in Miracle Morning that I read that it said, you know, find people in different areas of your life, business, personal and spiritual or whatever's important to you and send them an email asking them for feedback. How am I doing as a friend? How am I doing as and be w willing to welcome that back and ask them to be honest. And when he said that, I was like, God, that sounds awful. And we, we just don't, we don't grow if we don't know, we put these blinders on. And I think deep down, even as I'm having this conversation, I know that there are things that you, you, nobody is perfect, right? And that you just don't want to acknowledge. And then that goes into the company culture and, and it, what you're talking about is transformative. I could, I could see the way that it would transform businesses. Well, and I, so the other tool that I think really helps with that. So there's, there's two things that come to mind when it comes to feedback like that. One is you've got to build a foundation of a lot of positivity. So, you know, the more that you're positive, the more positives that you have, when you have that constructive piece or that constructive challenge, it makes it that, that much easier to receive it. Okay. Normally this person is very kind and positive and great. Like I've recognized all these other things. So then they're so much more willing, willing to hear it. The other thing is, so like I, like like you mentioned in the introduction, I'm a Gallup certified strengths coach, and I'm a huge advocate for that um, assessment. So they've got a Clifton Strengths assessment, and um, you get your top five strengths, or you can get all all 34 listed. But they're the things that come most naturally to you, the, the your natural ways of thinking um, and behaving uh, and and building relationships. And what I found is a lot, most of the time, our weaknesses are really our strengths misapplied. Our weaknesses are really the things that come really naturally that we're really good at when we're either over or under using them. And it, that has changed relationships for me. It's changed dynamics and it changes the conversation when you're giving feedback. And, and I'll give you an example. One of my employees has Achiever as her number one, which is the desire to get a lot of things done. And so when I come to her and I'm like, I think you're in, in the basement of your Achiever. I think you're, I think you're overusing it and you're too focused on getting through your to-do list and you're missing the big picture. She can go, okay, yes. That's part of who I am. I need to take a step back. And that's no longer critical or, or you know, something that is upsetting. It's just, it's just factual information to take in and adjust our performance based on it. So I think it's a really powerful tool that, that helps to create more meaningful conversations. For sure. That quote, weaknesses are your strengths misapplied. That's so powerful we we ignore them so much either because we think that they are actually weaknesses or we don't understand how to appropriate apply them what was the name for everybody listening what was the name of of the gallup survey so it's uh the clifton strengths assessment and I'm actually a, a licensed partner of, of Gallup. So Gallup gave me a license to use their content in my book. So it'll be in there and anybody can go get the assessment. It's only 20 bucks to take the assessment. So it's not an expensive, um, you know, an expensive investment to make. And honestly, like my husband, between my husband and I, my my relationships at work, like it, 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 it helps you so much have better conversations about the challenges in your life because you could kind of laugh about it and go, yeah, well, that's who I am. Like, <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll work. You keep working on it. You're not, you know, but you got to find another way because it's, you know, we don't want to be um, we don't want to be average. We want to be extraordinary. And, and you're not going to be extraordinary when you're just trying to be well-rounded. Yeah, that's, and, and that phrase, well, it's just, it, it's who I am. I am who I am. There's so many people who use that as a crutch. And then there are others 
who say, I don't want to be that person. And I don't know how to not be that person because the reality is we do have this genetic makeup of what's important to us and understanding it and knowing how to work within that framework is so important. So mm -hmm. I love that you brought that up. When does your book come out? So in like probably the next couple of weeks, so probably okay. mid September, um, maybe sooner. I'm just finalizing the cover and then it'll go up for sale on on Amazon. I am offering um, the link to the first chapter for free if anybody wants to take check that out but then um, the book should be available soon as well and then like I mentioned I'm giving a, a free workbook download as part of the book and a, a free course as well like an intro course to um, creating exceptional experiences so um, and why that's important and, and how to do that so it's kind of a, a, a an additional bonus if you if you go and buy the book that's really cool where, where can people go to, I know that you have like a pre-launch on your website. What's the best place for people to stay updated on when the book's coming out and also stay in contact with you? Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram, Jessica Tejan JD. There wasn't a Jessica Tejan. So I threw my, my JD on there as an attorney. So Jessica Tejan JD on, on Instagram. Um, occasionally I post articles on Medium um, or you can um, go to my, my website, Evolving to Exceptional. And that is where um, there's links to the book launch that's coming, um, as well as um, additional information as, as additional courses are added and other, other um, there's, there's more to, to learn or, or more new information to provide. Perfect. For the person who's listening to this, like me, um, that says, oh my gosh, there's so much in here that I'm in love with and so much that... I haven't necessarily thought of as deeply as I would like, and they can't wait until the, your book comes out. What is the best things that you could say? What steps could people take right now to start trying to better the relationships with the people they work with and then their families in that communication style? So I believe wholeheartedly that like the foundation of a lot of this is just connection. And so beginning to really develop meaningful relationships and connect with people authentically um, and, and build is always kind of the starting point. So like a lot of the other performance conversations around expectations, feedback, development, accountability comes second to building some of that foundation. And I talk about the need to really prepare for our journey to, to reach peak performance. And there's some foundational kind of skill sets that are in there. And, um, and I think that that connection piece is, is really really key. And also it's something that is missing in so many places today. Um, it's missing in our workplaces, it's missing in our homes and it's missing in our communities. And so the more that we can build that connection and look for what is similar and look for where we can um, come together, the better off we're going to be. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. You had mentioned before that you've taken these this information and these strategies into your everyday life and that it's impacted um, your relationship with your kids. What do you think is the biggest impact you've seen in your personal life with your relationships based upon these, these oh, strategies? So many. Um, so I think once I started to see my role as a mom as equally important to my role as, as in the workplace, as a leader, as a manager, you know, vice president, whatever, as, as, as that role, it caused me to think more about what am I expecting of myself? How am I doing at that? You know, am I growing? What do I need to know to be a better mom, to serve my children better? And there is massive, I'm not an expert in parenting or our, our childhood, um, our, you know, kids and strategies for kids, but there is massive amounts of information out there available and knowledge and new research to make us better and raise our kids better. And so um, I started to, to do that and incorporate that. And so kind of a funny story is, you know, my son um, loves to, to play with Legos. And so I started, I wanted him to develop a growth mindset. So I've always been telling him, well, we got to try, we've got to try hard, we got to try again. And so he would constantly have it fall over, right? He'd be building a big tower, it'd fall over. And I'd say, well, you got to figure out how to stabilize it. You know, we have to make it stable. How do we make it stable? And, you know, he'd keep getting bigger and bigger and then it'd fall. And, and he'd, and he'd be like, mom, I tried, I tried to make it stable. It was stable and it still fell. Well, if it fell, then it wasn't stable. Um, and so, you know, it'd be like, well, let's try again. And 
Um, and now he'll come to me and he'll be like, mom, I already tried. I already tried everything. I tried, tried again. And I'm like, okay, well, like, let's, let's give it one more, you know, one, one more try. Um, and, and, and then uh, the other thing is like with, you know, the saying good or bad, you know, good girl, a, a good boy, bad boy versus good choice, bad choice. It's so small of a change, but I've worked hard at it so hard that my husband made a mistake the other day and told my two year old, I have twin two year old girls um, and told one of my two year olds, like bad girl, bad girl. And my son came running up, dad, dad, she's not a bad girl. It was a bad choice. It was a bad choice, but she's not a bad girl. And my heart just warmed. And I'm like, oh, this is amazing. Cause that's going to be programmed for him for the rest of his life. You know, it's not, it's, it's just a choice. I made a bad choice, but that doesn't make me bad. I still get to choose what I do next. And so, you know, it's things like that, that I think are so powerful and they're so small, but they are going to make such a difference in my kids' lives. They, they are small verbal changes. They're not small impacts, right? Like right. they're, it's, oh my gosh. As, so I did tear up just a little because as, somebody who has struggled so much believing that the choices that I've made impact my value as a human being. And there was nothing that my parents did to intentionally instill that in me. It was my desire to be perfect, my need to be perfect that led to that. And the fact that you are intentionally choosing to program your children in a way that says good people can make bad choices and this does not impact who you are or what you deserve or the value that you carry as a human being like that that's so freaking amazing well and that's that's part of the evolution of our families like when i think about evolving families like doing it different than our parents did does not mean our parents did anything wrong they did the best with the knowledge that they had but we have more knowledge now we keep getting smarter as human beings you can look at any iq chart right so we keep getting smarter we should apply those practices and make the change so that our, our kids get the benefit of that new information, that new research, you know, the results of that. So, you know, I think it's, I think it, you, but you have to think differently, right? You have to think of it as more than just a task I have to do as mom and more of like a role I'm fulfilling and how do I want to fulfill that? And, and that's, and then you can be proud of yourself, right? Then I can hear my son do that and be like, yes, this is paying off. I'm doing good. Like the, do more of this. Keep it going. I'm thinking too how so many people are so exhausted in mother, wife, role in a corporate world, um, trying to stay fit, trying to be them, you know? And, and it's because they're fighting against themselves so much with what you're talking about. You're literally, you're literally transforming yourself into a person that can act and respond the same in situations at home and situations at work to where you're not using all that energy to be like, what role am I in? Or you have enough when you get home to be the person that your family needs in order to grow. I, it's amazing. Well, and then you have to choose what you're not what expectations you're not going to meet. So I am choosing these things, right? I am not good at like family pumpkin patch pictures or like, I'll be honest, my kid's birthday, my two year old's second birthday this year, we bought decorations and failed to put them up. Like, we were, we were just like so busy at the end of the day. We we're like, we never even put up the decorations, but you know what? Like they're two, they don't care. They don't care if there's a sign that says they're two, they got ice cream cake and we played in the lake and we, they had a bounce house that they jumped in and it was a beautiful day and it, they were happy. And so when you get clear in your mind about what I'm going to hold myself to and what I'm not going to hold myself to. And there are many times in my parenting journey. I mean, I, work full time as a leader in a business. I nursed twin girls until they were 18 months, not not because I wanted to, but they had a an allergy to dairy. So um, I literally could not put them on formula. So I mean, there were times I was nursing two babies on a leadership call, taught, I mean, doing the whole thing. And I, so believe me, I know exhaustion. I really do. But when you decide what you're going to do and what you're not going to do, then you can, then you take the power back and you take the power back to decide 
what really matters. And I tell my sister all the time, your kids are going to remember how they felt. That's what connects them to a memory is how they felt. And so just be there. You know, they don't care if the kitchen's clean. My house is a disaster. Like it's a disaster almost all the time. And I mean, not gross. I don't want to seem like too bad, but you know, but like there's toys everywhere, right? Because I just choose not to make that a determining factor for myself. I choose other things and I choose myself sometimes to have, have, to have time to write, to work on this book that I was so drawn to, to write. Um, and, and that's how I made it all happen. What's really sticking out to me right now there's a shift that I made within the last seven or eight months. You just described all of that. And not once did you use the word sacrifice, which so many people would think. And I remember I went through a training in November. And before I went through the training, I kept thinking, I have to sacrifice things to have what I want. I have to sacrifice, you know, time with my friends to go to the gym. And then I, I did this mindset shift at this training and the word sacrifice came out of my mouth after the mindset training. And I felt so dirty and I like stopped and I said, wait a minute, it's not a sacrifice. If you are choosing something that gets you closer to your goals, you're not sacrificing something else. You're just not choosing it. You're choosing this. And ever since that, I, the word sacrifice is like nails on a chalkboard to me. And that's the thing that stuck out the most is that through all of that, you use the word choices, not sacrifice, which is so important for people to understand. Yeah. And so at the start of my journey to write the the book that I, I'm, I'm publishing now um, to write The Exceptional Life Revolution, I got a um, coach who specializes in helping women who have messages to bring into the world to publish their books. That's her purpose. It's Freedom House Publishing. Her name's Kira Polson. And she was the one that taught me how to like craft your life around building energy into it and around um you know finding the 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 right um methods you know i wasn't a writer before so like i was oh, that was all new to me to 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 move through that creative process and i think what i found is the more clear i get with expectations the more i apply what i know to be true the more energy i get the happier i get not that the life is perfect. Like I always want to clarify because I have real big challenges in my life. You know, there are, and bad things happen and tough things happen, but I'm happier when they're going on and I move through them much better from a place of clarity and a place of, you know, ownership and understanding. And I'm able to grow through each of those processes. We've got 20 minutes left for this episode. Otherwise I just end it there. Cause that's, that's perfect. <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting the the word happiness, you know, people, there's a, there's a, um, commencement speech by, um, Charlie Day, where he talks about how people say, do what makes you happy. And he says, I'm not always happy. Like, do what makes you great and figure out what that is. And I thought, man, that's a message people need to hear because we're building this culture that if it doesn't make you happy, you don't have to do it. If it doesn't bring you joy, throw it out. Right. And it's, that's, you're not always, you're, it doesn't always make you happy. You choose to be happy in the circumstances you're in. Yeah, I when I first put together, so I do accountability training. When I first put it together, one of my employees, who's who doesn't work with me anymore, but I'm still close with her, she like refused to let us put happiness as a result of the training course. She was like, "No, it's success. You can't have." She, we have this big debate. You can't have happiness. And she said she'd only be happy if she was away in the woods all by herself, and then she still wouldn't be happy because she'd actually miss you know, her family and not being with her family. So there was no circumstance in which she could be happy. And I let her convince me of that at the time. And then years later, I was like, no, we're changing this. You <laughs> can be happy in spite of your circumstances. Absolutely. It is a choice. And I went through this really challenging time period where I had 
really serious, really serious health problems. I had chronic um, hives and an, um, an autoimmune, my, uh, an autoimmune response that was causing my face to swell up, my throat to swell up, couldn't breathe the whole works. And when, and there was one Christmas where I went through, I couldn't get out of bed. I mean, I was just, I was just a mess. And um, so I couldn't wrap presents for my son. I couldn't do all the normal Christmas things. Right. And um, it was through that process that I was like, but I can still be grateful. And I'm still here and I might not have wrapped the presents, but I'm still here to watch him and I'm still here to hold him and I'm still present and I still love him and all those things. So you, you start to shift and you go, okay, actually you can be in terrible circumstances in the worst, most challenging time of your life and still find joy, but you have to choose to do it. You have to choose to look for it. And likewise, people can have everything. They can have all the money, all the success, all the cars in the world and still be miserable human beings. And so, and we see it all the time. So that's why I'm just so passionate about like, it, like these are, these are doable changes. These are things that anyone can do and it will impact their lives. They will have better lives. Yeah. When you said that, um, we were talking about this before we came on, but there were about 10 names of attorneys that I see every day that jumped through my head when you're saying that, right? We have what everything we thought we wanted. And you wake up one day and you're like, holy crap, like what life did I build? And how do I give it to someone else? Like, yeah. what do I need to do? So I love that mission that you're talking about. Let me ask you this. I ask every single guest on this show, what do you... What is your personal definition of success? I believe we define it for ourselves and then we create it. But this idea that success just happens is failure waiting to waiting to happen. So for you, what does success mean? How do you define it? So it's funny that you're asking that. And um, that's so it's one of the things I always have people do. And I, I take them through different exercises a lot of times of like draw it or, you know, because sometimes it's hard for people to, to articulate it. Uh, or at least in my world, I work with engineers. So it's, it's <laughs> really hard to get them to articulate things. So for me, I really tie success to um, success to my purpose. Um, and my purpose in life is to help people live their best life possible so that someday when people look back on their lives, they think I lived a great life. Um, and they don't, they don't look back and think, I wish I had, I wish I'd done this differently. I wish I'd with all these regrets. And, um, and I do that via workplaces today. Um, I'm hoping to do that more through the book for, for other people. But for me, it's all about how many lives can I touch, including my children, my family, the, the people in my circle in my life. How can I um, help as many people as possible to live that exceptional life, to, to have that best life and to live one for myself while I'm doing it? So to, to be filled with joy, to find all of those, um, you know, exceptional experiences, both in my work and with my family, um, to make it, make it exceptional for myself so that I feel that way one day. So good. Um, was there a time where you saw that definition of success change? Has, has there ever been a point in time where success was monetary or, um, materialistic for you? And was there something in your life that changed that definition? Yeah. So in the beginning of my career, I was like the achiever. So I was like, how much can I shove into a day? How many tasks and activities and things can I get done? And I worked insane hours, which really didn't feel insane, right? Because law school's insane. Yes. So like it kind of screws with your perception of what like insane work days are. Like it doesn't I don't know. For me, it just never felt as long as it does for other people. Um, but I would I would just pound at it. Right. And I wanted to achieve exceptional workplace, uh, the exceptional workplace award. I wanted to get things implemented. And every time I got something implemented, every time I got our high potential program done, I got our talent strategy out. I got our org reviews going. I got our and it was like it was never enough. Right. Like it was always like, OK, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? Well, when I finally won the Gallup workplace award, I had this moment of like, okay, well now what, 
you know, now like that was the big like push to, and then I'd gone through those health challenges and, and I had my twin girls and it was kind of through that process that I went, whoa, there's a like, like, like it's not my worth is not how much I get done in a day. Like that's not who I need to be or want to be. And that's when I really shifted and said, you know, no, I'm going to do this differently and I'm going to look at this differently and I'm going to experience life differently so that I can, can have the exceptional life. Yeah, I can totally relate to that in the way of, I was reading a book where they were talking about scheduled stops they say, I think we have all these scheduled stops on this life that we've built for ourselves. And at some point in time, there's no more scheduled stops. And she wasn't talking about it in a transformation way. She was talking about it as, okay, now I have all this freedom. Mm -hmm. But when she said that, it hit me. Like I had my breakdown and started to realize that there was more to life than being an attorney. When I had passed the bar, I had a six figure income and it was, there wasn't anything else to work for. Mm -hmm. It was every day was groundhog day and it was awful. And it was, you were waking up, going to work, coming home exhausted, going to bed, waking up, going to work. Yeah. And I, thought, I thought at some point in time that if I got this, like life was going to be better than this. It was, it was going to be more fulfilling than this. And so when you talk about that moment that you won the, the Gallup award being what else is there, I totally relate to that. I can totally feel it. Yeah. And I, I think when you, when you hit that point, I mean, what you realize is that like, is like the fulfillment is not going to come from outside. And, and so it's really, and I think we all kind of go through it and we all experience it at different points. And, and my hope is to try to move it earlier and earlier into life. Like a lot of that. people that don't hit it until they're retired, you know, and they're like, what have I done? Or even on their deathbed. Right. And so how do we move it earlier so that we're living wholehearted lives so that we're living um, in a way that that brings joy and and happiness and results to the to the world. And it's not that it's not that I don't still work as hard. I actually still work really hard. It's just I do it in a way that brings me a lot more joy because I choose what really matters. And it's not about getting through a checklist or getting more done or or hitting some arbitrary goal. Yeah. So good. I'm, I'm in love with this conversation. So for everybody who's listening that wants to follow up with this one more time, where is the best place to contact you? Yeah. So you can uh, follow me on Instagram, Jessica Tijin JD, and I will be posting updates there or check out my website at evolving to exceptional.com. And, um, and, and I think you're going to provide the link um, with this to the, to the free chapter and the, and the website there. So you can, can check out or get the first chapter for free. Absolutely. Those will be in the show notes. So you can check those out um, in the show notes or you can follow Jessica on social media, which I would suggest both. All right. I've got a quick random round for you. We'll wrap this sure. up with that. Are you okay with that? Yeah. All right. If you could do any profession other than what you're doing now, what do you think would be fun to attempt? So this is sound insane because I actually am a lawyer, but um, I would really love to do... Um, uh, criminal defense work, but for those who've been wrongfully accused to do the, the, that in a volunteer capacity. Yeah, that's amazing. That's where I thought, that's why I went to law school where I did was because of the innocence project and wanting yeah. to be involved in that. It's so needed. Yeah. So needed. If you could time travel, where would you go and why? If I could time travel, I would probably go into the future to see what comes next so that I can um, help us get there. I like it. Do you have a book other than your amazing book that's coming out that you recommend to people the most who are trying to find that way to shift their perspective, to shift their life, to find that fulfillment? Gosh, I read so many books and I love them all. Um, I believe that so one of the one of the authors that is endorsing my book, Sean Acor, um, with Harvard, he wrote The Happiness Advantage, and that was one of the places that I started with getting the mindset principles. Um, and I I and and I just think it's I think he's phenomenal, and I think his concepts are phenomenal. So I think that's a great you know place to start with with learning about those principles and the research behind them. 
I like that. I'm going to have to check it out. I haven't read that one yet, but it's been suggested to me. So I'll have to check that out. When you read, are you a reader? Do you like to change, turn pages and highlight or do you listen to audiobooks? Both. Um, so I, I buy books. I like to like mark up books, underline right in the in the um, columns and stuff like that. But I also love to listen. So I will. Um, I, and I've gone through a ton of books like that just while I'm brushing my teeth or, you know, getting ready for bed or whatever. And I just listen. So I'm typically reading or listening to, you know, three to five books at a time, almost all of the time. And sometimes I even roll my eyes at myself like, why am I? I can't start another book, but I want to read that next book so yeah um so i need to know if you have the same curse that i do or whether i'm just crazy do you ever start an audiobook and you're getting through it and you're like oh this is too good i know that i have to get the book and so you finish the audiobook and then you buy the physical book and you highlight it and take this yes. I'm okay well, i'm glad to know i'm not the only one i yes. feel like i have so many different formats of different books because i was like one just isn't enough well i did it with um so don't no, Brene Brown's, th that was the other place I was going to go was Daring Greatly by ben Brene Brown. Yes. But I did her Dare to Lead book. I listened to it. Um, well, actually, I think I read it and then I listened to it or maybe, I don't know. But actually, I got so much more doing both because um, having listened, I, I listened to it first and then I read it. And when I then was reading it, I could read it so much faster, but pull out like the really key things for myself. Um, and so I, I actually really like that. I like going back when there's when there's key books like that to go back through and pull those those key insights because a lot of her stuff is pretty um pretty deep, I think. So it takes a bit to, to um, understand it. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting that phrase, you never read the same book twice. Like by the time you finish that book, you have a different mindset, something clicked for you, and then you get to go through and read it again. And it's like books that I've read five, six or seven times, I'm still pulling things out that hit me in a different way, which goes back to what you were talking about as far as how do we get that conversation started earlier for people. And it's all just about planting that seed, right? About having this conversation with them as early as possible because they do have to experience it. But hopefully when they experience it, they have those seeds planted that they can say, oh, wait, this doesn't have to be like this. Yeah. And you mentioned rereading. I've reread my book like, I don't know, a hundred times to edit it. And every time I reread it, I'm like, oh, that's good. I'm going to use that with Justin or I'm like, <laughs> I want to talk to him tomorrow about that or, you know, whatever. So like, it's, it's the same thing. Like, yeah, you can go back to and use those same principles. And I agree with you. Your mindset's different. So it impacts you differently. It's so interesting to hear you say that because we get in such autopilot with what we're talking about. And at this point, these are these things are so ingrained in us because of the work we've done that when we talk about them, they don't seem like they're as impactful as they are. And my podcast editor will always send me quotes and I'll be like, who said that? And he's like, you dummy. And I was like, oh, I'm smart. Like... <laughs> People do listen to what I say. So I can imagine that that's what it's like for you when you read your book. Yeah. That's interesting. All right. Last question. I'm a music nerd. What's your pump up song? What is it that you put on to listen to and you just can't have a bad day? So it's it's not like a, I know it's not like as much of a pump up song, but I love to listen to Don't Worry, Be Happy. Okay. Um, and, and just kind of dance around with my kids. And now we will like switch around, um, but there's a, a station on Pandora that's happy. So I put on the Pandora happy station all the time and it just has like really great fun music. And it also like a lot of the music takes me back like, I don't know why, but I guess there was a lot of happy music in the 90s or 2000s. So it takes me back to, to my more like high school, high school years and stuff I listen to. That's amazing. Jessica, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I'm really excited for people to check out your book. I'm excited to help people find that because I believe that what you're talking about is going to transform the way that people lead and the way that people hold leaders accountable in a workforce. And I think that's so needed. Yeah, I'm, I could not be more excited about it. So anybody that wants to reach out, reach out to me. You know, I'm, I'm just a regular person and I am so excited about all of these concepts and, and love to talk about them with people. Awesome. Thanks so much.
Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the More Than Corporate podcast. If anything that was said during this episode resonated with you or provided value in any way, it would mean the world to me if you would head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review for the More Than Corporate podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. I'm really looking forward to connecting with you. If you'd also like to connect, I've created a Facebook group that is full of amazing people who also make it their mission to live their best life every single day. If that sounds like something that you're interested in, the name of that Facebook group is Success Center. Head over there, request to join, and I look forward to connecting with you soon.